Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, The Role of Endosomes in Prostate Cancer. Presented by Dr. Ian Johnson, Research Fellow, University of South Australia. I'm Christy Jewell of LabRoots and I will be moderating today's session. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Today's event is sponsored by Gibco by Thermo Fisher. To learn more about our sponsor, please visit thermofisher.com forward slash cell culture heroes. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want during the presentation. Simply click on the ask a question box located on the far left of your screen, type in your questions into the drop down box and click send. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Ask a Question box to let us know you're experiencing a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located on the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Our speaker today is Dr. Ian Johnson. Dr. Johnson is a leading molecular cell biologist in prostate cancer, focusing his research efforts on endosome lysosome biology in this disease with the seminal discovery of altered endosomal biogenesis in prostate cancer. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Johnson. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Thanks. Thank you, Christy, for the introduction. And thank you, Thermo and Gibco, for the opportunity to say, to talk to you about the role of endosomes in prostate cancer and the work I've been doing in this area. I'm Ian, I'm a research fellow down in the Mechanisms in Cell Biology and Diseases Research Group, which is part of the University of South Australia School of Pharmacy and Medical Sciences. This lab group is headed by Professor Doug Brooks. We're based in the new University of South Australia Cancer Research Institute, which is part of the Adelaide Biomedical Precinct. That comprises the new Royal Adelaide Hospital, the SA Health and Medical Research Institute, the University of Adelaide Health and Medical Sciences Building, and our own CRI. Importantly, for the cricket lovers out there, we get a great view of the Adelaide Oval and occasionally see a few olives bold. Since we've no doubt got a diverse audience today, I'm going to briefly give you an overview to the prostate and then some background into endosome biology. I'll then take you into the work that we've done characterizing prostate cell lines, the seminal discovery of altered endosome biogenesis, and the involvement of endosomes in other aspects of prostate cancer biology, such as in reactive oxygen species production. So the prostate is this walnut-sized gland that's got an outer shell or capsule within which we find fibromuscular stroma and the transitional central and peripheral zones. It's situated beneath the bladder of which the urethra passes through. And as we know, if we have a benign or malignant growth of the prostate, this can impact urethra and bladder control quite significantly. The secretory epithelial cells arise from these stem cells that differentiate into transit amplifying cells. And there are other types of cells, such as the basal, neuroendocrine, and stromal cells. But primarily, prostate cancer, prostate cancer pathogenesis initiates from secretory epithelial cells. And they look normally something like this. So in prostate cancer, in Australia, more than 17,000 men are diagnosed with a disease every year. That represents more than 28% of newly diagnosed cases. Each year, there are more than 3,500 deaths. That represents 12% of all cancers, and it's the second most common cause of cancer-related deaths, second only to lung cancer. Globally, more than a million are diagnosed every year, and there are over 300,000 deaths. And we can see on the graph on the right that incidence and mortality are strongly linked with age, with incidence really occurring in men over the age of 40. The current gold standard for prostate cancer diagnosis is the PSA blood test. That tests for the protein prostate-specific antigen, or calocrine 3. And the problem with this test is that it's unspecific. It could be elevated due to benign enlargements, such as the benign prostate hypoplasia, or due to 
infections such as prostatitis or urinary tract infections, and indeed inflammation. A more prehistoric method of testing is the digital rectal examination. And this is not recommended as a routine test. If it is performed, it should be performed by an expert urologist and it only to complement high PSA blood tests. And this is where the urologist will palpitate the gland and attempt to detect any hardening, swelling, or surface lumps. Problem is, these won't necessarily indicate that there is a tumor, and so further investigations, such as biopsies, are always required. So with both of these methods, there are too many false negative or false positive results. You cannot determine how severe a malignancy is, and treating them as well can often cause greater morbidity than living with a disease. As such, current guidelines don't recommend a population screening program. There are other cancer markers. For example, C-reactive protein can be used for prostate cancer. However, this has other malignant associations, such as colorectal or ovarian cancer, and of course, many benign associations, whether that's inflammation, or as a result of injury or infection, or cardiovascular disease. CA-15-3 and CA-19-9 also have uh, relations to prostate cancer. However, again, these are not specific to the disease. As such, there is a more specific need for more sensitive and specific diagnostic and prognostic markers. So historically, there was evidence of an increase in, uh, in lysosomal expression, lysosomal changes in cancer. And as such, competitin D can actually be used potentially as a marker for breast cancer metastasis. They've seen that acid ceramidase is upregulated in prostate cancer, and that confers oncogenic phenotypes. And also, we've got cathepsin B, which has high activity on the exterior face of tumors. These hydrolases are found within lysosomes, and lysosomes are these membrane-bound organelles with a pH of about 4.5. And that's important because that regulates the enzyme activity. Lysosomes are also critical for cellular degradation, cholesterol homeostasis, and autophagy. The release of these lysosomal enzymes can also trigger apoptosis. So the lysosomes are membrane-bound organelles, and they're part of the endosome lysosome system. And that is the primary interface for contact between the intracellular and extracellular environments. They control secretion of biological molecules. And through their provision of membrane material, they're essential to cell division and proliferation, intracellular signaling. And of course, they're by no means static, as we can see here in this video over a couple of minutes. So the biogenesis of endosomes and lysosomes is defined as the synthesis and organization of structural elements of the endosome system to form an integrated set of functional organelles. The organelles are involved in the biosynthetic or endosynthetic pathways. The biosynthetic, meaning reticular traffic from the endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi towards the distal elements of the endosome network, and that includes the early, late um, endosomes and multifasicular bodies. And we also have the endocytic pathway, and that involves membrane transport from the cell surface through to early recycling and late endosomes. So I'm going to take you through a basic tutorial of this process now and some of the critical machinery required, which we'll be revisiting later. So here is a very average cell. We have our plasma membrane, and we have these membrane-bound receptors. As we follow these receptors, ligands, such as transferrin, bind, and that induces a change, such as phosphorylation. That phosphorylation event enables RAB5 to bind. We've also have clathrin forming, this clathrin coated pit, that creates this endocytic vesicle. We just saw the association of two cofactors, apple 1 and apple 2. They bind to RAB5, and we can define this vesicle by the presence of these markers. This is otherwise known as a pre-early endosome. Because we have this ligand-bound receptor, we can potentially have signaling from this compartment as well. PI3P induces dissociation of apple 1 and apple 2 and provides a binding site for another protein called early endosome antigen 1 or EEA1. So this compartment has now matured into an early endosome. 
we just saw dissociation of a ligand from a receptor. That's because this end, early enzyme is slightly acidic, and specific cargo that's uh, destined for this compartment will dissociate. From the biosynthetic pathway, from the Golgi, we have membrane-bound receptors here that bind their respective cargo. For example, we have manic phosphate receptors binding lysosomal hydrolases, or LIMP2 binding beta glucosidase The signaling motifs on their cytoplasmic tails induce their trafficking to their relevant compartments, and they travel through the early endosome. Other material, such as the calocranes, of which PSA is one of those, will head to the recycling endosome, which we'll come to later. So the early endosome matures into a late endosome through this RAB5, RAB7 switch. So we can define late endosomes by RAB7. Again, it's slightly more acidic, and so we have further dissociation of specific cargo from their receptors. It's interesting. We have LIMP2 here as well, and LIMP2 is a critical regulator of biogenesis of endosomes, and when it's overexpressed, it can actually result in swollen compartments and impaired trafficking. We also have other machinery here, such as the escort proteins, and these cause the invaginational outward budding of vesicles from the late endosome. This traffics material back to the Golgi, for example. The invagination of the membrane creates these intraluminal vesicles and a compartment known as the multifesicular body, or MVB. And if that MVB fuses with a plasma membrane, these intraluminal vesicles will be released, and that's what are termed exosomes. Finally, we have the lysosome. This is the highly acidic compartment, and this will fuse with the late endosome and reform for cargo delivery, or the multifesicular body will fuse with the lysosome. Either way, Many proteins are degraded in this compartment. We also have the recycling enzyme, which is a critical organelle for the recycling of plasma membrane receptors back to the plasma membrane. This recycling enzyme is defined by RAB4 for fast recycling enzymes and RAB11 for slow recycling enzymes. And we see here the receptors have trafficked back to the cell surface. So there we have it, a relatively simplified model of the endosome lysosome network and some of the critical proteins involved. So our initial hypothesis was that lysosomal function would be altered in prostate cancer and that this might result in the release of lysosomal proteins from prostate cancer cells or reveal markers that facilitate early detection. We started off investigating many of the prostate cancer cell lines that are available. Now that's because only a limited number are often used in literature, particularly with the non-malignant cells. So the validity, validity sorry, of this model is not established. To be honest, it is a massive pain in the ass dealing with so many cell lines, particularly with all their culture requirements. But thank you, Gibco, for at least inventing a wide necked buffer as an angle. So. We analyzed a bunch of lysosomal proteins and genes, such as acid trans, ceramidase, and the cathepsins B and D. And this was quite interesting, because it showed that the commonly used RWTE1 non-malignant cell line actually had significant elevate, significantly elevated expression of these lysosomal genes and proteins, especially of transcription factor EB, or TFEV, down at the bottom right. And that's important, because that's actually a master regulator of lysosomal biogenesis. RWP1 and CAHPV10, which is a cancer cell line, actually showed very similar phenotypes in the protein processing and expression of a lot of these genes and proteins. So we think that there are some artifacts resulting from that HPV transfection. The other non-malignant cells, PNT1A and PNT2, are actually transformed to SV40 and didn't display these same characteristics. So we also measured intracellular protein expression and found that there was a wide variation in these cells and there was certainly nothing striking. However, when we looked at the secretome, we found that the cancer cell lines have an upregulation of some of these cathepsin B and acid ceramidase, which had previously been alluded to. 
what's interesting is that we saw uh, that the capepsin D didn't have much, mature capepsin D didn't have much change, but mature capepsin B did, despite their overall expression not really being different between the two. This actually uh, suggested that maybe uh, these were being released from an endosome location. And that's because they mature in a slightly different way at a slightly more basic pH than the lysosome. So of course, we also analyze the cells by confocal fluorescence, and we find that lysosomes do have a change in distribution. In the non-malignant cells, PT1 and PT2, we get this perinuclear localization, and in our cancer cells, we get this wide dispersal of pericellular LAMP1, particularly out to the periphery. So I mentioned earlier that lymph 2 is a critical regulator of endosome biogenesis, and we found that was elevated between two and fourfold in both gene and protein expression in some cancer cell lines versus non-malignants. That's interesting because overexpression can actually disrupt trafficking through the endosomal system. So we postulated that the biogenesis of endosomes, but not lysosomes, was affected in prostate cancer biology. And that there's a fundamental change in the biology of endosomes in these cells. So we investigated some of these early endosome markers that we previously alluded to. As previously discussed, LIMP2 was upregulated, but also Apple one Apple II, RAB5A, and EA1, which are all part of this early endosome system. I also saw upregulated RAB4, but we did not see any change in these late endosome RAB7 or the lysosome LAMP1 gene and protein expression. Importantly, these changes were observed in microarray cohorts, and we saw that the expression was increased either in primary cancer or decreased in metastatic cancer. So there's some dysfunction, deregulation happening here. What's also interesting is if you combine alpha one rap 5 and EA1 gene expression, they can predict cancer recurrence. So these are patients that have had cancer, prostate cancer, and when you uh, divide them by K-means clustering into high or low gene expression groups for these three genes, we see that high expression potentially results in great chance of relapse. But since microarray cohorts are a bit hit and miss depending on what era they performed and how many samples were processed, it was important to measure them by qPCR. So we obtained fresh frozen samples from the PCRC Biobank in Dublin, Ireland, and they were carefully cut, H and E stains, and then studied by expert pathologist John O'Leary at Trinity College. And the approximate location of the cancer tissue was noted, and a rough dissection uh, was performed, followed by RNA extraction. So it finally, despite the very rough dissection happening, the changes of gene expression, Apple Ron Rep5 and EA1, were big enough to overcome that dilution of cancer cells with normal cells. So we want to know what endosomal processes might be altered in prostate cancer that could affect pathogenesis? Returning to our cell lines, we know that much like lysosomes, early endosomes are also mispositioned. And here, an example of EA1, early endosome antigen 1, where again, see perinuclear localization of early endosomes in the non cells. And in the cancer cells, we see greater pericellular distribution of these compartments. So functionally, we can measure the differences that this might uh, uh, create, and that is using, for example, ligand uptake, uh, in this case, transferrin, where transferrin binds these transferrin receptors and get uptaken over a period of time and delivered to their uh, final uh, organelle, which uh, is the Golgi. So in the normal link cells on the left, we see over the period of half an hour that these, uh, this transferrin, which is in white, migrates to this perinuclear region. And in our cancer cells, they remain dispersed throughout, particularly at, these, uh, at the tips of the cells. And that actually affects the signaling as well. So we can use AKT phosphorylation as a measure of this uh, signaling. And we see that PNT1A and these 2 non-malignant cells have upregulated AKT phosphorylation, as you'd expect. However, that appears to be quite decent 
dysfunction or deregulated in the cancer cells. In fact, with 2012 v one we didn't detect any phosphorylation at all. So the conclusion from this was that old enzyme biogenesis and enzyme function is uh, the enzyme biogenesis, sorry, and enzyme function is altered in prostate cancer. And as a result of the upregulated enzyme machinery, the altered location of endosomes or lysosomes, and this disturbed trafficking and signaling. So it's a potential new avenue for investigation for the development of markers that may aid in diagnosis and prognosis. So we'll now move on to other aspects of endosome biology that are affected in prostate cancer, and that's, for example, VEGF signaling. And this is work done by Ian Harrison with about NOx2 oxidase. So VEGF ligand uptake by VEGF receptor 2. The receptor undergoes recycling through the early enzyme, to the recycling enzyme, back to the plasma membrane. And it requires this internalization in order to actually perform its signaling. If we delay VEGF receptor enzyme trafficking, we end up with dephosphorylation, receptor deactivation, and decreased arterial morphogenesis. Interestingly, VEGF stimulates production of reactive oxygen species, such as superoxide and hydrogen peroxide. These can promote cell proliferation and angiogenesis, and they're highly reactive. They're generated by these NADPH oxidases, or NOx enzymes. One of these is NOx2, and NOx2 resides on these early endosomes. So we investigated whether endosomal NOx has any influence or alterations in prostate cancer. And we found that yes, they do. <laughs> First of all, we see with NOx2 that primary cancer has elevated expression of NOx2. And in NOx4, we see quite an elevation in metastatic tissue. Using our prostate samples from Ireland, we also saw that in aggressive tissue, NOx4 was significantly upregulated. Using a synergenic model of prostate cancer in mice, when we delete NOx2, that actually decreases angiogenesis in prostate tumors. And that's also the same when we inhibit NOx2 oxidase pharmacologically. So on the right here, we can see a decrease in CD31 positive cells and a reduction in VEGFR2 positive cells in the NOx2 knockdowns. VEGF receptor internalizes into early endosomes. We see here EEA1 co-localizing with VEGF receptor 2. But when we inhibit that uptake using dinosaur and pit stop, that inhibits endocytosis of receptors through various means, we saw a decrease in that co-location. So we can measure the capacity of VEGF to stimulate superoxide production. And we found that the superoxide increases, that's shown in green, that increases at 30, with 30 nanograms and 100 nanograms per mil of VEGF ligand. This happens over time, between 0 and 30 minutes. We can see here through the time course that the superoxide production increases. And that's likely as the VEGF ligand enters these endosome compartments. We also see that when we knock out NOx2, superoxide production is significantly reduced. NOx2 co-localizes not much with APA1 and not a great deal with EEA1, but we see a significant co-location of NOx2 with these RAV5 endosomes. And it's also important to note that endosomal pH is important for superoxide production. When we treat with bacillomycin, which inhibits the vacuolar VTPase, which mediates enzyme lysosomal physication, we end up with a neutral, neutralized endosomal pH, and that just significantly diminishes superoxide production. So in summary here, we saw that noxoxidase is expressed in endosomes promotes prostate tumor development. 
when we knock it out, it reduces the angiogenesis. So we think that altered enzyme biogenesis may affect frost production and the downstream events. And the increased expression that we saw in cancer is likely to elevate frost production. Moving on, I present some work performed by Heather Armstrong on investigating HSB90 inhibitors. These are second gen inhibitors. And this is some interesting work on uh, fibronectin and cytoskeletal changes. So HSB90 is a molecular chaperone with ATP8, ATPase activity. And it regulates the stabilization, maturation, and activation of over 200 other proteins, otherwise known as clients. And that's an important target in prostate cancer therapy, especially due to its involvement with androgen receptor, shown there on the left. Loading of client proteins is driven by the binding and hydrolysis of ATP, which results in the release of mature clients. On the right, there are many more of these, onco, uh, these clients, otherwise known as oncoproteins. So not only is HSP90 important in testosterone activation of androgen receptor, but also in the signal transduction of membrane receptors, such as receptor tyrosine kinase on the right here. And that's important because AR can still be activated if in cataract resistant prostate cancer. So if we can inhibit HSP90, we are ultimately can inhibit these pathways and oncogenic effects. So the inhibitors act by blocking the binding of ATP to the heat shock protein. And that enables the clients to actually be targeted for degradation. What was interesting was that HSB90 inhibitor a 92 actually affects fibronectin expression. It increases in response to the drug. And fibronectin is associated with the extracellular matrix, and since it's secreted, it combines with integrin to bind the cell to collagen extracellular matrix. Interestingly, not only does the inhibitor increase fibronectin gene expression and protein expression, it also reduces its secretion. This is an example of just what fibronectin would do. Binds to the integrin and then to the collagen. So we see this. Uh, secreted fibronectin that is inhibited. And that's interesting because it also increased the apoptosis cells and decreased their proliferative potential. So with this, we also saw increased density of fibronectin staining in cells, as shown here. And these were in these punctate compartments which we saw as early and late endosomes. This co-location is in white. We don't see any accumulation in lysosomes where it would be degraded. So the method of secretion may well be from these multicellular bodies or early endosomes. And that makes sense, since fibronectin has been seen in extracellular vesicles released from prostate cancer cell lines and in the plasma and urine from clinical patients. Trafficking to the plasma membrane is dependent on microtubule association proteins. And there are several of these which are known clients of HSP90. And the interesting thing is that we saw a reduction of myosin expression in response to HSP90 inhibitor. And this could well be what's trafficking fibronectin out of the cell. And the model is something like this. We have our HSP90 and microtubules, and the fibronectin being trafficked thoroughly by myosin along these microtubules being secreted. With the inhibitor, the microtubule is no longer there, or at least the motor is no longer there to traffic these compartments. So the fibronectin just fills up in these early or multicellular body compartments. So in summary here, we saw that AU192 alters cell structure through inhibition of HSP90. We saw a reduction in the expression of microtubule proteins, reduction in enzyme trafficking, and reduction in secretion of this extracellular matrix protein, fibronectin. That will inhibit the cell to communicate or attach the surrounding tissue, 
and it increases cell death and reduces proliferation. So I'm finally going to raise some work that has just been submitted for publication on a, an endosomal protein called Syntenin-1. And Syntenin-1 is, is critical for exosome biogenesis in those multifacicular bodies you've seen earlier. It's a critical adaptive protein that can affect cytoskeletal membrane organization, cell adhesion, protein trafficking, and activation of transcription factors. So you've all seen blocks like this with uh, commercial antibodies that we buy, and it doesn't matter what blocking conditions you use or how you uh, treat the cells, you cannot get a specific band. And you cannot determine the expression of the protein. So we've developed spatially distinct epitopes to unique linear sequences on Syntenin-1. And these are unique to the 6 or 7 amino acid level, meaning it's unlikely that the antibody will bind to other proteins. Indeed, the two epitopes that we've targeted give these beautiful, clean Western blocks. And when we knock out syntenin, we see the reduction as expected. So these antibodies are specific. What's interesting is that we can use these two spatially distinct antibodies together in an ELISA so we can capture syntenin 1 using one antibody and detect it with a biotin related uh, Syntenin antibody coming in on top. But when we looked at these with immune fluorescence, we saw some striking differences. We have classical endosome puncture highlighted by our 2C6 epitope, but the 3A11 highlights these microtubules. And that's really interesting. It's not impossible that it isn't syntenin. We certainly have seen evidence in the literature that supports this hypothesis that it's a new isoform or variant, depending on functional variant. Indeed, here in an area scan image, we see co-location of beta tubulin and our syntenin 3A11 epitope. What's interesting is that we saw an increased staining by immunohistochemistry in uh, prostate cancer tissue using 3A11, whereas with 2C6, we did not see so much uh, staining in either non-malignant or malignant tissue. So we suggest that these new monoclonal antibodies might highlight the multiple functions and protein roles, potential roles of syntenin-1, through and though further investigation is required. So to conclude, we've seen today, through characterizing multiple prostate cell lines, both non-malignant and malignant, that HPV or mortalized cells might not be suitable for studying the cell biology of prostate cancer. We've seen this altered endosome biogenesis through the upregulation of early endosome and gene and protein expression, and the altered endosome traffic that results. We've also seen that in other cell biology that's critical for cancer pathogenesis, whether it's ROS production or secretion of factors, they all require these endosomes. And so the change in endosome biology may disrupt these critical functions and promote pathogenesis. And we've just seen the potential of a new isoform of syntenin that's a critical cofactor in exome biogenesis. I want to thank the teams at UniSA, with Emma Parkinson Lawrence, Alexandra Silvina, Jess Logan, Chelsea Thomas, Jess Heatley. Thanks, Professor Lisa Butler over at University of Adelaide, whose PhD student was Heather Armstrong, who's now at the University of Alberta, Canada. Stav Solemidis down at RMIT and Ian Harrison for work on the NOx uh, proteins. Uh, John O'Leary and his team at Trinity College Dublin. And also Professor Bill Watson, who is the uh, head of the PCRC uh, cohort. Uh, finally, Juan Bonaficino at the NIH, along with David Gershlik and Charlie, and also Roberta. Finally, our funding, which is from the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia, the Centre for Men's Health, and the SA Cancer Council. Thank you for listening. There's much more that uh, can be discussed. Uh, there's a lot more work to be done. You can find me at any of these uh, addresses, and I'll now open it up for questions. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Johnson, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many questions as time permits. Okay, Dr. Johnson, your first question. Do you have any idea why the RWPE1 and CAHPV10 cell lines performed so differently to the other normal or cancer cell lines? Sure. Yep. So um, we think that uh, when these non-malignant uh, cell lines were established, um, these abnormal phenotypes were introduced through that viral transformation. Um, and that, that viral transformation is record, required simply to uh, make these uh, normal cells, healthy cells, keep proliferating. But the RWP1 cell um, expresses E6 and E7 oncoproteins, and the CHBP10 expresses the E6 oncoprotein. So these are enabling uh, cell cycle progression uh, to continue unimpeded. But they also stabilize accumulation of T53, uh, and that's, uh, that's been shown to affect lysosomal stability. Uh, the SV40 cell lines, the PNT1A and PNT2, they only express large T antigen, and they lack a P53 stabilizing agent, so that's why there's that difference there. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you. Our next question. Can you please expand on why cathepsin B and acid ceramidase are secreted when other lysosomal, lysosomal proteins were not? Sure. Um, uh, from memory, uh, Cathepsin B, as reported to mainly have um, an endosomal location, whereas Cathepsin D is more lysosomal. Um, so these are processed in these uh, alternate compartments. Um, the same with acid ceramidase. It's, uh, it matures in an endosomal compartment and not the lysosomal compartment. Um, and it also has, acid ceramidase has a specific role in multicellular bodies. So whilst uh, aceramidase is trafficked with the manosic phosphate receptor, um, altered uh, glycosylation uh, can uh, change where this uh, aceramidase is uh, trafficked to, so it can be diverted into secretory vesicles. Um, so we're seeing process, a process form suggesting that it is trafficked to the enzymes, but that it's potentially being released either in secretory vesicles or uh, or from these multi-particular bodies. Thanks. Dr. Johnson, the transferrin that showed different distributions in cancer cells, do you know what endosomes these were? Yeah, I, I didn't actually show these. Uh, we did perform um, co-location studies. They were more qualitative than quantitative. But it seemed that in the non-malignant cells, uh, we had clustering of transferrin with uh, or co-location of transferrin with LIMP2 and RAB7. So this suggests that uh, it's in the late endosomes, and those were near the nucleus. Um, in the cancer cells, we did see some transferrin with LIMP2, but also at the Golgi, uh, the majority of the transferrin in those cancer cells was in the APA1, RAB5, and EA1 compartments. That's where it seemed to be co-localizing with those markers. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Now, it looks like we have time for one more question. Have sure. you investigated whether androgen receptor expression or androgen response affect the expression or biogenesis of hmm. endosomes? Sure, sure. So that's quite an important thing for, for prostate cancer, um, particularly since it's driven, or the primary cancer is driven by androgen, um, hence why androgen deprivation therapy is used. So the... Uh, those cell lines do express uh, higher amounts of these um, endosomal markers than, than uh, non-responsive cells or some non-responsive cells. Um, but we're encouraged to find that those ex the expression of those genes was elevated in primary cancers. Um, and it's perhaps why in metastatic cancers, things uh, return to normal or decrease. So they may very well be driven uh, by androgen response, but we haven't actually done any specific studies on those yet. Uh, there is some uh, some databases online where they have done treatments. And I believe RAB5 is upregulated. Thank you again, Dr. Johnson. Now, do you have any final comments for our audience? Uh, thank you all for listening on this afternoon or morning, wherever you are. Um, 
you can reach out to me on the media channels uh, that are on the screen. Uh, I want to thank again my collaborators uh, and thank, of course, uh, Gibka Thermo Fisher for this opportunity to speak. And thank you, Christy, for setting this up. Thank you again, Dr. Johnson, for your time today and also for your important research. We would also thank like you. to thank Labrador. Yes, and our sponsor, GiveCo by Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Now, before we go, I would like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Again, questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast will be available for viewing on demand. Labrads will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. You will now be redirected to the microsite where you can register for our upcoming webinar, utilizing the lens of Athelio Explant Culture System to investigate cataract formation, presented by Daisy Shu. Thanks for joining us, and we hope to see you then. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you.